Hello, my name is Rob Holland, and I'm the Development Director for the Humboldt Bay Harbor District, also known as the Humboldt Bay Port Authority. This is the first in a series of presentations about offshore winds in general, and then ultimately narrowing down on the Harbor District's proposed wind terminal project. This is a long version of an introductory uh, presentation. Uh, I'm also releasing a short version later today. Uh, there'll be more information about offshore wind in general and the Harbor District's project on the district website. Be aware that this presentation is for multiple audiences, some of whom will be local, some will be international, some will be technical experts in this field, some will be just beginners. I'm trying to cover ground for everyone. So with that, I am going to switch to the presentation here. And like I said, this is really general background uh, covering offshore wind in general, um, targeting at the very beginning of this presentation, a general audience that doesn't know a lot about offshore wind and drilling into more and more detail by the end, getting to the district's project. Uh, and there will be more presentations in this series, more specifically about the district's project in the future. Uh, this picture that you're seeing here is Humboldt Bay uh, and the site in the background right in the middle is the ultimate location uh, that the district is proposing the first uh, wind terminal uh, development project on the west coast. So let's start by just asking uh, what is offshore wind? So this is a coal fired power plant produces electricity. This is effectively an offshore wind power plant. It's a series of wind turbines clustered together in the ocean that are all strung together with electrical cables that then comes onto land and supplies power um, to facilities on land. Here's another way of looking at that. We zoom in here. In this case, you can see that the wind turbines are floating, and I'll get into a lot more detail about that, but you have floating wind turbines floating in the ocean, strung together with electrical cables that go to an offshore substation or a barge that has a substation on it. it looks just like a substation that you would find on the grounds in, in any city. And then that power comes on shore to another substation that then is transmitted to homes and businesses. All right, so that's generally what offshore wind is. I'll get into a lot more detail, but first let's ask ourselves why we're even talking about offshore wind at all. And it comes down to the coming end of carbon-based power. Uh, with climate change and the need to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions, we are going to be transitioning our energy sources. The federal government has identified offshore wind as one of those ways that we can produce uh, non-carbon based power. So the federal government, the Biden-Harris administration on September 15th, 2022, announced a goal to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind in the US by the year 2030. So for a little bit of background, what is a gigawatt? One way of measuring a gigawatt is by looking at how many homes one gigawatt can power. And this resource says that a gigawatt can power somewhere between a quarter of a million and half a million homes. I've seen estimates that a gigawatt can power a million homes. But just conservatively, let's say that 30 gigawatts is the equivalent of powering 15 million homes. So within the next seven years, the federal government wants to power somewhere around 15 million homes worth of energy through offshore wind. Another way of looking at 30 gigawatts is that is about the equivalent of 60 average coal-fired power plants. So also within seven years, the federal government wants to see the equivalent of 60 coal-fired power plants worth of energy being produced in our oceans with wind turbines. This is an ambitious goal because in the year 2020, the whole world had 35 gigawatts of offshore wind. And so in seven years, the federal government wants to effectively double what the rest of the world has done. Those are the federal goals for the year 2030. If we zoom in on the state of California, the goals are even more ambitious. So this document here is the state's plan to achieve 100% clean electricity in California um, by the year 2045. And the state's already well on the path to that goal. So in the year 2013, we had as a state 41% clean electricity. In the year 2020, it was 60%. 
Um, by the year 2045, the state wants to have 100 percent. And the plan to get there includes a number of different types of power. And so this is the portfolio of different power sources that the state plans to use and develop over time to get to that goal. And you can see there's lots of different types there. So if we just look as an example, we have two types of solar. You've got utility scale solar, which are big you know, power plants that are solar based. And then you've got customer scale solar, which is solar on top of the homes uh, of people or businesses. Or So you've got different amounts of this kind of power the state plans on having generated by the year 2045. Among this portfolio is wind power, both offshore and onshore. And you can see here that the state had planned on having more onshore wind power by 2045 than offshore wind. But about six months ago or so, the state changed its goals for offshore wind and changed its ultimate goal um, to having five gigawatts by 2030 and 25 gigawatts by 2045. So that's a big change. And so now we have state and federal goals that we're keeping in mind as we're moving forward. For the year 2030, the US wants to have 30 gigawatts of offshore wind with the state having five gigawatts. By the year 2045, uh, the US, with actually 2050 for the US, um, is targeting 110 gigawatts or more of offshore wind by the year 2050. And the state of California wants to have 25 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2045. So we've got both state and federal goals that kind of sync up um, but both equate to a whole lot of offshore wind being produced in the coming uh, uh, 30 years or so. So where is all this offshore wind going to occur? Well, on the east coast of the United States, there are about 27 areas um, that have been either leased or are in the process of being leased to energy companies for the production of offshore wind. So there's a lot of those. Each one of them is several hundred square miles. On the West Coast, there are really only four, two of which have been the, the leasing process has begun and two of which in the Oregon, uh, off the coast of Oregon, um, where the process is planned for later this year, uh, late 2023. So why the disparity between the East Coast and the West Coast? Why does the East Coast have so many more areas identified and leased? Well, it comes down to bathymetry or the depth of the water. So if we zoom in on this and enhance it to make it easier to read, dark blue is extremely deep and the light blue teal color is very shallow. So you can see the difference of the east and west coasts here. Uh, on the east coast, you have very shallow water that goes out 40, 50 miles. And on the west coast, it gets real deep, real fast, pretty much right away. It's extremely deep, it just drops right off. And so it comes down to the technical requirements of those two different conditions. In shallow water, you can have monopiles, which are effectively the same as an onshore wind turbine. It's you know, anchored into the ground and happens to be poking out of the water. You get deep enough and the substructure gets more complex, but it's effectively the same thing. But you get too deep, you can't do that anymore, and you get to a point where the turbines have to be floating on a platform in the ocean that is then anchored to the sea floor. And so the floating offshore wind is a new technology, much more complex and more expensive. So long story short of why the East Coast has more areas currently is because the technology is easier. It's easier to do monopoles than floating offshore wind. Despite that, the federal government has identified goals explicitly for floating offshore wind, and the state of California has acknowledged that its entire offshore wind ambitions are going to be with the floating technology. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus just on the West Coast and primarily California, but realize there's a lot going on in the East Coast as well that we are both learning from and watching uh, as their industry progresses. So looking California, there are two locations that have been already uh, initiated the lease process for power companies to lease several hundred square miles of ocean to produce these floating offshore wind power plants. In the north, you've got the Humboldt Offshore Wind Lease Area, 
and in the central southern part of the state, you've got the Morro Bay offshore wind lease area. Then we also have up in the north two uh, lease areas in Oregon. And so if we look at Humboldt Bay and do a 450 mile radius from the bay, you can see that the Humboldt lease area is immediately off the coast of Humboldt Bay. Um, Humboldt County is the is a very far northern county in California, Del Norte County just to the north of us, um, and the Humboldt lease area immediately off of Humboldt Bay. The Morro Bay lease area is about 450 miles south. And then the Oregon, Coos Bay, and Brookings Call areas you can see are quite a bit closer than even the Morro Bay lease area. And Humboldt is conveniently located right in the center of all of that action. Also, if we look at wind resources, there's Humboldt Bay again. Dark red is excellent wind resources and uh, green is less good wind resources. So the brighter the color, the brighter the red, the better the wind resources, better for an offshore wind farm. So you've got the Morro Bay wind lease area down here. It's in an orange um, yellow area, so pretty good. Humboldt Bay, dark orange, touching the red, um, really good um, wind resources there. And then the Oregon uh, areas are also really good. But if we look to the south of Morro Bay, you can see that the wind resources really diminish as you move south of Morro Bay. So it is probably unlikely that there will be additional lease areas south of Morro Bay, though it is possible. And you can see south of the San Francisco Bay area, also not the best wind resources. But just north and south of Humboldt are literally the best wind resources off the coast of Del Norte and Mendocino counties, respectively. And so if the state of California is going to reach its goals, these two locations are almost inevitably going to have offshore wind areas as well in the future. And so that makes Humboldt even more centrally located to all of the action that's associated with offshore wind. And just for context, how good those wind resources are off the coasts of Del Norte and Mendocino. This is a map of the wind resources in the whole U.S. land and U.S. waters. And you can see that the two areas just north and south of Humboldt are literally the best wind resources in the country. So those are great places to put offshore wind power plants. OK. So let's look at these two areas that have already initiated the leasing process uh, off of California's coast. So zooming in on each of those, you can see that the northern one, the Humboldt one, has been broken into two sub areas, blue and pink. And then the Morro Bay, uh, the southern one, has been broken into three areas, uh, purple, green and orange. Those correspond to these five companies here who won the lease process, competitive lease process, to lease these areas to establish wind farms. And they're color coded, so you can see RWE is blue, et cetera. Collectively, these five companies bid over three quarters of a billion dollars to lease these areas. Uh, we'll come back to that. But first, let's talk about how large offshore wind turbines are and what these companies are in for, what they're really proposing to do in these areas. So this is, you know, the general makeup of an offshore wind turbine, and it really comes down, the complexity comes down to the floating structure. So this is an example of a floating structure. This is being manufactured in China. And for context, you can see a person down here in the image. These things are 100 plus feet tall and a triangle, uh, equilateral triangle in this case, on which each side is about 425 feet. So if you were to take one of these and put it in the football stadium of Eureka High School, this is what it would look like. Not that that's being proposed and actually wouldn't be technically possible, but just for context of how big these things are, that's what it would look like in the football stadium. Or on the Arcata Plaza, that's how big it would look. Or the, uh, the uh, Fortuna River Lodge. Or Dodger Stadium. Or at Oracle Park in San Francisco. So you can see these are really massive structures, larger than a city block. They come in different shapes and sizes, but generally they're triangular uh, and generally about that 425 plus feet on each side of the triangle. 
With the turbine stacked on top, this is how tall they can be. So this is an evolution of wind turbines over time. The first offshore wind turbine um, was in 1990. And you can see its size. Each generation, it got larger to the point where this is the largest that's currently deployed in the world in 2022. And that is the tip of the blade under a thousand feet. Uh, but you can see the Eiffel Tower and the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. It's really quite large structure. We're planning for the future because as you can see, these grow over time. And so if you're going to build facilities to accommodate offshore wind, you need to plan for the future. The one all the way on the far right is the theoretical maximum of what a uh, wind turbine could get to be given material science. Again, any larger than the, the blades can't hold themselves together. It's, we just don't have the materials large enough to exceed that size. But there's nothing uh, near that size currently planned or envisioned that I know of. What we're planning for is this new generation of 15 to 20 megawatt turbines here where the tip of the blade uh, could exceed 1,000 feet and the nacelle or the hub in the middle there is somewhere in the six to 800 foot range. So how many of these turbines need to be manufactured? Well, it comes down to thinking about the detail of how many different parts there are. So you've got the blades and the nacelle or the central centerpiece. You've got the towers, the floaters, the mooring lines that hold them to the ocean floor and the anchors that, that are on the ocean floor transmission cables, there's a lot of different parts that all have to come together. So how many of these need to be manufactured? Well, keeping in mind that we've got all those individual parts, uh, I think it's helpful to just look at one of them uh, as an example of, of the volume of materials we're talking about. So let's start with just the mooring lines that hold the floaters to the ocean floor. If California's goal is 25 gigawatts, which it is, and we assume that uh, each turbine uh, is 15 megawatts, then you would need about 1,700 turbines to meet that state goal. Each one of these floating uh, platforms requires three mooring lines, so you'd need 5,000 total lines to be manufactured, and each one would be about 3,000 feet long, which means the total mooring lines would be 15 million feet long, with 5,000 plus feet in a mile, we would need 2,800 miles of mooring lines. And these mooring lines can be synthetic cables or large chains, but either way, it is a massive undertaking to manufacture these, and there are really nothing, there's nothing like this currently being manufactured on the West Coast, so it's a whole new manufacturing industry. And just for context, if you were to take all those 2,841 miles of mooring lines and lay them end to end from Eureka, they would go all the way across the country through New York City and out into the ocean another two or three hundred miles. So that's a lot of material that needs to be manufactured. And that's just the mooring lines. We also have 1,600 floaters, 1,600 nacelles, 5,000 blades, a million feet of towers, and miles and miles of transmission cables. Um, I haven't been able to calculate that one yet. The point of all of this is that there are a suite of new industries that all need to be created on the West Coast that currently do not exist. As I'll show in a moment, all of this material is too large to transport in any way other than a, uh, a seagoing vessel. And so all of this is going to be port related manufacturing. So this is what the tower manufacturing looks like. And the nacelles, uh, the, the centerpiece, the, produces the energy, um, literally larger than a house in some cases, uh, the anchors, a lot of other parts here. So now that you have a kind of a understanding of the materials that are being manufactured, how fast do these need to be produced for the state to meet its goal? Well, with a 25 gigawatt goal by 2045 and 15 megawatts per turbine, then we're talking about that 1600 turbines to be man or produced. And if production starts in 2027, which may be ambitious, then we need 93 turbines to be produced per year or an average of 1.8 turbines produced per week every week for 18 straight years. And that's just for California's goal. Uh, if you recall, the federal goal by 2050 is 110 plus gigawatts. So uh, I haven't calculated that, but that's uh, an awful lot more. Four times that amount. So how? 
is all this going to be done? How are wind turbines made in general? What well, helps to think about uh, onshore wind turbines versus the off offshore ones. And on the left here, we have the largest wind turbine on land that has been deployed to date. And on the right, you have um, what we're planning for, 17 megawatt um, turbine. And you can see that the largest land-based wind turbines are half the size of the planned offshore wind turbines. The reason that's relevant is because the onshore wind turbines have the challenge of having the materials all moved across the land. So here you can see blades being moved by train. These are small blades and you can see the car in the background. Um, these are small blades because you can't get much larger and move them by train. You can get bigger and move them by truck, but even that becomes challenging and it's becoming more and more difficult to manufacture and transport onshore wind turbine components becomes the, the most difficult challenge is moving them if they get too big. And this blade here is less than half the size of the planned offshore wind turbines. So the only way to move them is by ship. Can't move them any other way, which means that they have to be manufactured in a port because you can't move them across the land and they have to be moved by ship, then they'll have to be manufactured next to ships in ports. And then you have to take all those parts and put them together in the water. And so this is really a port related infrastructure and industry. So the, uh, you know, the offshore wind is really being uh, innovated and you know, uh, led by Europe. So there are a number of port facilities in Europe that are doing exactly this. And the East Coast of the United States is now getting in the game. And so this is a planned facility in New Jersey and New York and uh, Massachusetts. So how are these manufactured? If they're manufactured at ports uh, and then once they're manufactured, how do they get to their operational location in the ocean? Step one is component manufacturing. You have to make all of those individual parts, again, in ports. Step two is staging integration or vertical assembly, where you take all those parts and put them together in a port. And then step three is operation and maintenance, really the running of the power plant, um, which is in the ocean. So let's start by looking at this step one. So you can see in the bottom left hand corner here, a person with the tower being manufactured. Um, again, this would have to be uh, in a port so that it can be lifted onto a ship and transported by ship. Here's blade manufacturing. And on the right, you can see blades being laid out in a port being ready to be lifted onto a ship. You've got nacelles, this one being lifted onto a ship. So all of this is port related manu or port uh, side manufacturing component manufacturing. And a lot of this can happen in pretty much any port uh, in the world because these can be moved by ship. Step two is staging integration or vertical assembly. Once you've got all these parts, you have to put them all together, but these parts collectively are very heavy. And so these port terminals here have to be five to 10 times the bearing capacity or strength of a standard shipping container wharf. Now, if we can take a step back here for a moment, the things in yellow can be transported to this staging and integration facility from pretty far distances, but the things in red, the floaters, the heavy lift crane, and that heavy terminal that's really strong, those have to be relatively close to the ultimate offshore wind power plants to which they are servicing. So for instance, these blades are enormous, potentially too large to fit inside of a baseball stadium but you can still manufacture them in a port, put them on a ship and ship them from pretty much anywhere in the world to that vertical assembly site. The towers can be made in smaller chunks, too big to be moved by truck, still moved by ship, but they can be shipped from any port in the world to your vertical assembly site. Same with the nacelles. But the floaters, are simply too large to be drug all the way across the Pacific Ocean. They really won't fit on a ship. Individual components of it will. So here you have three pontoons effectively all connected together. Those could be potentially manufactured in a port like San Diego and then shipped to the vertical assembly site. 
Uh, but they're not going to be shipped in their entirety across great distances. Well, it's probably technically possible. It's it's really just cost prohibitive. So back to the staging and integration vertical assembly site. Step one is to gather all of those manufactured parts at the assembly terminal. So you have to get all these parts from various ports. Could be very close by ports. It could be very far away ports. But you get all those parts together. Then you have to make the floating foundation. And uh, this they're so large that they're moved across the ground like a space shuttle onto a barge that then is semi submersible, sinks beneath it. The floating foundation is then floating. It's towed over to the crane. Uh, the barge comes back up and is ready for another one. So the step 2B is to assemble and launch the floater at the assembly terminal. Now you've got all the parts and you've got the floater. And the next step is to actually do the vertical assembly of all of those components. The next step, once it's all done and ready to go, is you have to tow that fully assembled turbine out to sea. That step, that towing from the port to the ocean is going to mean that many ports are incapable of doing this vertical assembly stage. For instance, all of San Francisco Bay is out because the Golden Gate Bridge at the mouth of the bay is not, uh, not going to accommodate uh, the tow out uh, uh, requirements. So you've got vertical draft restrictions. So again, you can see the Golden Gate Bridge in the background, and you can see we're planning for turbines that exceed this uh, size here. So San Francisco Bay can't do this vertical assembly stage in the towing. Now, one thing to point out here is, you know, while this is manufactured in a port and towed out to sea, uh, it's towed out pretty pretty far distance. So the Humboldt call area, the Humboldt lease area, for instance, is more than 20 miles off the shore. So while you see pictures like this, uh, you really wouldn't see uh, turbines like this unless you were on a boat. Um, this is a visual simulation of what the turbines look like um, from Patrick's Point or Sumig um, State Park in California. Uh, and this is what it would look like um, if you zoomed in. So up here in Humboldt, you don't uh, have a ton of really clear days. It would take a very clear day to see them, and they would be very small off in the distance. And again, this is a zoomed in uh, view of that. Then once everything's out in the ocean and operational, then you have step three, uh, operations and maintenance. And this is when uh, this is really operating the power plant. So you've got a lot of ships that are going to have to go out to these turbines. People are going to have to get up onto the pontoons and the floaters and you know, maintain all of this. There's probably going to be new helicopter pilots, um, a lot of technicians, very likely drone pilots. Um, there'll be a whole lot of people working to inspect this equipment. And then a lot of it is underwater, so there will likely be jobs related to diving and driving uh, submarine uh, uh, drones to inspect lines and the, the floaters. So that's generally how it's all done. Um, so who's going to build these turbines? Well, it's important to differentiate the fact that we've got two really separate projects here. We've got the operations of offshore wind farms. And then you have the manufacturing and the you know deployment of the equipment. This is Bohm and energy companies. And these energy companies want to get these turbines and operate them, but they really don't want to necessarily build them. Then you've got ports and port operators that can build them and then effectively sell them to the uh, offshore wind companies. So you have two distinctly different projects, operation of a power plant and the manufacturing and assembly of equipment. One analogy I like to use here is if you wanted to run a kayak rental business, you can be in the business of renting kayaks, but you're not necessarily in the business of manufacturing kayaks. You would purchase those kayaks from a factory or a company that manufactures them. It's possible that you could do both, but probably unusual. Most people that are in the kayak rental business are not in the kayak manufacturing business. And if you're in the kayak rental business, you can get your kayaks from any one of a number of different companies. 
And if you're in the kayak manufacturing business, you very likely sell your kayaks to multiple kayak rental businesses. So while they have a relationship, they are really distinctly different from one another. To complicate this a little bit more, there's actually a third type of project that's going to be required for all of this, and that is the upgrade to power transmission. Once these power plants are operational, the power needs to come on shore uh, and move around in ways and places that currently don't have sufficient power transmission. So that's a whole nother suite of projects. Since I'm here representing the Harbor District and a project that I'll show you in a moment, I'm really going to only from this point on talk about the manufacturing assembly of equipment in ports and that operation of the power plant and the power transmission are really different projects and you would have to um, coordinate with other entities to understand those better. So let's look at this port operations here of what ports and port operators are going to do. So in California, there are a number of ports um, moving up the coast here. And each one of them is going to play an important role in this. And there are other ports. This is just a quick summary here. You've got component manufacturing. Some of these ports are going to play a really important role in component manufacturing. For instance, the Bay of San Francisco is likely to pay an important role of that in various ports in the Bay. Then you've got staging and integration. This is what the Port of Humboldt is going to be specializing in. And then you've got operation and maintenance, um, which will occur close as close as possible to each of the lease areas. Like I said, the Bay of Humboldt is going to be specializing in staging and integration. And it just happens that uh, there are very few ports in California that are really going to be capable of doing this particular uh, activity. According to a study by the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management that I'll show you in a moment, it's really the Port of Humboldt, Port of LA, and the Port of Long Beach that can do this state step. And it's because you have to have very special conditions for vertical assembly. You have to have the right channel width, so the, the width of the navigation channel through which the ships and the towing and the floaters are going to be towed has to be wide enough. It also has to be deep enough. Can't have any vertical draft restrictions like airports or bridges. And you have to have large development areas, 100 plus acres, to be able to lay down all these blades and the towers and the cables and the floaters, uh, and then put them next to a wharf and vertically assemble them. So here's that study from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that looked at California floating offshore wind regional ports assessment, assessing all of the ports' abilities to service the offshore wind industry. And here's a map um, that shows green, are ports that are good candidates for staging and integration. Yellow are ports that are moderate, and red are ports that are not candidates. So then if we look at each of these ports here, Humboldt is green, everyone else is red except for LA and Long Beach. So according to the federal government, there are only three ports in California really capable of doing this staging and integration work. Then there's manufacturing. A lot of port can do this well. So according to that same study, looking at all these individual types of components that need to be manufactured, same color system here. Port of Humboldt is good for manufacturing. Most of the ports in the Bay of San Francisco are good. Uh, and then you've got LA, Long Beach, and San Diego. So a lot of options there for manufacturing. And then the operations and maintenance. Remember, this is gonna be crews of people uh, that are going to live relatively close to these offshore wind areas, and they're going to be getting on ships daily and going out to the wind turbines to do various operational maintenance activities. So this really comes down to proximity and the ability to host the equipment and the types of ships that need to go out. And so you can see Crescent City and the Port of Humboldt are both close enough to the Humboldt lease areas to be able to conduct operations and maintenance. Uh, all of the ports in San Francisco are a little too far for that to be realistic place to do operation and maintenance. Then you've got the cluster around uh, Port San Luis and Morro Bay, Diablo Canyon. Those uh, have the, the right parameters to do at least some of the operation and maintenance as well as Port of Guainini. But LA, Long Beach, San Diego are a little too far away. So you put this all together. And the Port of Humboldt is the only port that is triple green for all three of those needs of the offshore wind industry. 
LA Long Beach are both double green and every other port is only single green at most. So according to this study by the federal government, the Port of Humboldt is really the best suited, has the right parameters um, to um, service the offshore wind industry and its various needs. So I encourage you to look at this study from Boeing uh, and this regional ports assessment. So let's look at uh, the Port of Humboldt Bay and the proposed project here and just get an understanding of why Humboldt Bay is triple green. Why is it so good for offshore wind? Well, coincidentally, one of the things not even evaluated in that is Humboldt Bay's central location. Recall this map here where Humboldt Bay is in the center, this 450 mile radius, um, and you know, really centrally located to the planned lease areas. In fact, so central that even if the Humboldt lease area were to go away, Humboldt Bay would still likely serve a really important role in the current and planned leased areas. And if Humboldt lease area went away, it would still be central to what is probably going to be um, upcoming lease areas. And so with or without that lease area off the coast, the Port of Humboldt Bay would still play an important role. And I guess what I'm implying here is that the uh, vertical assembly that occurs in Humboldt Bay is very possibly, probably going to serve some of the lease sub areas in Morro Bay and in Oregon and ultimately Del Norte and Mendocino counties. But the Humboldt lease area off the coast is not likely to go away. So let's look at that. Um, so you can see how close it is to Humboldt Bay. Uh, it's the closest that any of the lease areas are directly um, to any existing ports. Mm -hmm. So that's a real advantage. And uh, I'm just going to give a little context of the bay here for those that don't know Humboldt Bay very well. Uh, it is the second largest bay in California after San Francisco Bay. You've got the city of Eureka right here uh, in the heart of the bay. The city, whoa, sorry, wrong direction. You've got the city of Eureka, Arcata, the city of Arcata, and uh, California Polytechnic University of Humboldt uh, up here just to the north side of the bay. You've got College of the Redwoods, two-year technical school in the southern part of the bay, and the Weat tribe um, here just on the southern end of the bay. And all of this area, uh, all of Humboldt Bay is ancestral Weat territory. If we rotate this map a little bit and zoom in and overlay another map on top of it, um, I'll show you some of the details of the bay and start talking about uh, offshore wind. So if we zoom in here, you can see this teal blue dashed outline area is the federal navigation channel um, that is maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So this area is dredged down to a depth of 48 feet below mean low water or below uh, low tide. And it is a minimum of 800 feet wide uh, in that dredged area um, in that entrance channel. That then comes around the corner into the bay to the Samoa navigation channel, which transitions to 38 feet deep with a minimum width of 450 feet and continues down the channel into the industrial portions of the bay. And all of these purple areas, including this green one, are coastal dependent industrial lands that formerly um, were filled up with um, timber related and wood product related industries and Humboldt Bay was really a bustling timber and fishing port uh, until the 1980s, 1990s, when a lot of these facilities um, stopped operating and now are either you know, largely vacant or heavily underutilized. So there are literally in the range of three to 600 acres of available uh, coastal dependent industrial lands in Humboldt Bay in these purple areas. Uh, the fishing fleet is still going strong here, but the timber industry isn't nearly as uh, ubiquitous as it once was. So you've got the Federal Navigation Channel coming here to a turning basin. And then this green area is the Harbor District's uh, envisioned um, development site. And this is really a perfect location for offshore wind. As I said, it's got the right channel widths, the right channel depths, and it's at the end of the navigation channel. Um, so that other uh, activities in the bay aren't really disrupted. And a lot of the fishing fleet is down here in this channel uh, and in this marina. And so I'll get to a moment in um, what the rolling closures will look like um, when these are towed out. 
And speaking of that, when the, you can see here these floating turbines, kind of samples of, of the you know scale of those, once they're manufactured at this site, the weather window or tidal window may not be perfect for them to be towed out the entrance and out the bay. And so these orange areas are candidate locations for wet storage. And since this map was produced, we've really narrowed this down. Um, but we're looking at locations where these turbines can be parked temporarily for a day or a couple of days um, before they're towed out. So let's talk about just uh, a summary of Humboldt Bay's assets for offshore wind. It's got the right channel widths and depths, no vertical draft restrictions. It's got immediately available industrial sites with direct access to the Federal Navigation Channel, and it's geographically central to short and long-term wind areas. So let's zoom in on this project site here and see what uh, the Harbor District is planning. So this is from uh, a 2021 image that was updated in the middle of 2022. Um, this is kind of a master plan of this whole area that the district's been working on for quite a while. And uh, this image has been out there a lot, but we have a kind of a new updated image um, that I'm going to, oh, well, just for one last thing, just for context of how big this site is, 180 acres. And if we were to take this project outline and lay it down on Old Town Eureka, this is how big it is. So for those that are local, this would be the equivalent, and I've done this before, um, walking from Jack Seafood all the way to the Open Door Health Clinic. Um, so walking this project site is, um, is, is quite a distance, 180 acres. It's really a big site. But anyway, this is an older version uh, and this is an updated version. So I'm gonna walk through um, what the district is envisioning with this 180 acre site. So first of all, you've got somewhere in the range of 600,000 square feet of manufacturing buildings uh, here um, on the site. This could be for manufacturing towers or blades or other components. Um, and this is you know, one of the possibilities of, of what could happen at this site. So you've got manufacturing of components up here. Then over here on this side, you've got the floating foundation assembly. So you take the individual parts of the floating foundations, put them together, and produce the whole floating foundation. That floating foundation is then moved across the ground onto the wharf and onto a semi-submersible barge. Uh, and this sinking basin concept that we're still exploring, but potentially has a sinking basin so the barge can sink underneath of it and then the floater is in the water. Once it's in the water, a couple of different things can happen. The floater can be floated over here to a wet storage area where it's temporarily stored. So it would look something like that floating in the bay while it's waiting for vertical assembly. Or it could be towed over here to wharf number one where a large crane, and you can see the reach of the crane in this dashed circle, would then put on the tower and the nacelle and the blades. And so you can see in this image here, you've got the towers already on, one of the blades is already on, here's another blade that's about to be lifted and put on, and here's the third blade that's about to be lifted and put on. Then once it's there, that can either be towed out to sea, which looks like this, or it can be towed over here to this on-terminal wet storage area um, where it can wait to be towed out to sea. So it's for a fully integrated there. And so you can see in this example, there are two fully integrated, vertically integrated turbines waiting to be towed out. Then on this side, there's another wharf over here that's also doing vertical assembly. And so this is a floater and blades and nacelles and towers will be brought over to this crane and it will be vertically assembled where it can then be towed out to sea or uh, taken to this on terminal wet storage area. So that's generally what the site looks like here. There's, there's so much going on in future presentations. We'll talk about this project in a lot more detail. You know, some small things to point out is the whole site is, is we're planning on preparing for sea level rise. Um, we're working on a shoreline transition. Um, you know, there, there's a number of berths here that will need to be dredged. Uh, and you can see a large delivery vessel here. This, for instance, would be coming over to one of these wharves when it's not being used in this way to deliver blades or nacelles, et cetera. 
So general project objectives here is to support state and federal goals um, to, you know, having a staging and integration terminal. One possibility is that instead of having um, these uh, manufacturing buildings here, we can try to find a way to specialize even more in staging and integration. So going back to supporting state and federal goals, since Humboldt Bay is one of the few places where staging and integration can occur, one of the best things that the Humboldt Bay Harbor District can do to support state and federal goals is to specialize in staging and integration. Manufacturing can happen elsewhere, but there are not many places where vertical assembly can occur. But manufacturing does need to occur and there'll be cost efficiencies, so maybe manufacturing would happen on site. And obviously operation and maintenance also needs to occur close to the terminal or to the operation of the wind plant there. And in some cases, once those turbines are out at sea, they're one of the blades after 15 years may need to be replaced and the whole thing may need to be towed back into port to have a blade replaced. And so some operation and maintenance activities um, will have to be done at these large uh, heavy lift terminals. Another project objective is to redevelop this largely unutilized site. There are a couple of um, small tenants that are currently on the site that we're working with to relocate over time, um, but uh, largely uh, unutilized uh, site. We also want to establish Humboldt Bay as a global leader in addressing climate change and to build to green standards, um, greenhouse gas emission reduction, on-site energy production, green buildings, electrification of the terminal. These are really things that we're working towards and evaluating the possibilities of. And then another project objective is to prepare for sea level rise. So you've got vertical assembly in two locations, uh, and could we do a third one? So we're evaluating that possibility. So if you were standing on this arrow and looking at the site, this is what it would look like currently. And from this end, this is what it currently looks like. And in this image, you can see that um, there's a large old redwood dock. Uh, and so that would be replaced with a new uh, heavy lift concrete terminal. And I showed a second one out here. This redwood dock would go away. That would become water, really a dredged berth. This whole site would be um, compacted gravel. And then you'd have some large cranes along the shoreline. This is pretty much what the site would look like. We'll have uh, much more sophisticated visual simulations coming out in a couple of weeks or, or maybe uh, late summer. So progress of this project to date. Harbor District has received a 10 plus million dollar grant from the California Energy Commission has really gotten all of this going. Harbor District or the State Lands Commission uh, also uh, invested in this project, and then the Harbor District um, has also invested quite a bit into this project, both money and staff time. All of these things have been completed to date. Uh, in the interest of time, I encourage you to pause that if you want to know more. Um, the Harbor District, through a competitive process, hired Moffitt and Nickel um, to conduct all of these activities, the permitting and design. Another major milestone to date is the signing of an exclusive right to negotiate with Crowley Wind Services, who will be um, developing and operating this terminal. This project has a lot of anticipated project benefits. Humboldt will be a leader in energy decarbonization and addressing climate change. Uh, the, there will be a vast diversity of new jobs and economic development. Redevelopment, revitalization of a vacant blighted site, stimulation of other projects around the bay. So I showed all those other uh, areas um, that are uh, coastal dependent industrial zone lands very close by to the proposed project site. Those could be manufacturing locations. An opportunity to create a green port, electrification, on site renewable energy, green building materials, opportunity to implement a first of its kind project in preparing for sea level rise. Uh, we could stimulate a 12-month all-season port through increased ship traffic and more attention from the Army Corps for dredging. Uh, and new revenue to the Harbor District that can be used for other purposes such as dredging, conservation, recreation, and other purposes of the Harbor District. And maybe this would uh, stimulate tourism. 
So plans for 2023, continuing to use that um, California Energy Commission grant. Uh, we plan on identifying strategies to support as many call areas as possible, determine options for wet storage, stakeholder engagement, CEQA, NEPA permits, 30% design, channel tow-out modeling, finalized field surveys. Um, so a lot of activities planned for 2023. If you're looking to get involved, um, this is we're a little behind schedule here, but in June, we will be releasing the CEQA notice of preparation. Um, stakeholder meetings will occur throughout 23 and early 24. A lot of regulatory agency meetings, public meetings, uh, and we plan on completing the CEQA NEPA and permits in 2024. Uh, very soon, there will be a new page on the Harbor District's website about all of this, and so keep your eye on the Harbor District's website um, for regular updates. One last thing I want to point out before I get to my frequently asked questions section here is the opportunity for baywide master planning. So I showed this map before, and we looked at the Harbor District's two vertical assembly sites, maybe three. Um, so those are going to be the first projects to come online in the bay. But then there can also be offshore wind component manufacturing happening at other sites around the bay. Right, so different things could be manufactured, different sites very nearby to the vertical assembly. And there's operation and maintenance. This is really the parking of vessels, uh, a couple of small buildings, um, you know, some supplies, but doesn't have to be a really big site unless you're talking about towing them back into to, to the bay in which the vertical assembly sites of the district's project could take care of it. But you've got an operation and maintenance site um, where the crews prepare to go out to sea every day. It's going to have to be workforce training, so Cal Poly Humboldt certainly getting involved in workforce training, College of the Redwoods, um, but there could be, you know, an on or, you know, a facility uh, on the bay that specializes in workforce training. Then upgraded ship repair. Uh, so right now the district has a travel lift. This isn't it. It's, this is actually a little bit smaller than the district's travel lift, but we've got one of these and it's probably not big enough to service the ships. Um, that will be coming to the bay. So that is also a future project. Then battery storage. It's going to be a lot of power coming from uh, the offshore wind area. Battery storage will make that whole system more efficient. So power transmission projects likely to come out of this. Uh, road upgrades. The need for dredge disposal. Um, upgraded fishermen's work areas possible. So uh, an upgraded fueling terminal. So there's a lot of potential projects uh, in the County of Humboldt and ultimately the Harbor District plan on conducting baywide master planning activities um, to see where all of this could go and how to best plan for all of it. So that is the end of the presentation, though I do have a whole lot of frequently asked questions. I've given this presentation many times and I've collected kind of a list of questions that I frequently get asked. So one of them is, is the district operating a wind farm? And the answer is no. This is our project. This is not the district's project. So like I said, uh, you've got all of this activity out here with these offshore wind areas. Even if the Humboldt wind area went away, the Harbor District's vertical assembly and manufacturing project would still be very relevant and needed by the state of California. And so our project is really not directly related to the Humboldt offshore wind call area. Our project is a vertical assembly and manufacturing facility. This is offshore wind farm operations. This is offshore wind component manufacturing and deployment, different things. This is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that's going to be leading the environmental permitting processes. And this is really the port and port operators that will be leading the environmental permitting processes associated with this. And here's an analogy, maybe a little bit overdone, but I think this can be helpful. So imagine you want to open a brewery. Well, you've got a lot of different things going on when you open a brewery and you need the equipment to make the beer. All the way across the country, say in Cincinnati, there can be a factory that makes the equipment to manufacture beer. And that factory needs to be constructed somewhere. Once it's constructed and they manufacture their brewery equipment, then they can put it on a truck and send it across the country to the location where you plan on opening a brewery, say in California. 
Now your brewery might be near a wetland and might have its own environmental impacts that really aren't associated with the factory that made the brewery equipment. So you've got two different locations, two different sets of impacts. Once this new brewery building is constructed, it needs to get a lot of parts. So it has to order doors from one factory. It has to order pint glasses from a different factory and tables. And right, all of these things have to be manufactured elsewhere. And the brewery is simply just buying the equipment. Among the equipment it buys is the equipment to make the beer. Once that's installed, uh, it's, it's part of the facility. So project number one is to build the factory that produces the equipment. And project number two is to build the brewery that actually makes the beer. And in this case, our brewery or our factory can supply materials to brewery A, but it's almost certainly going to supply materials to other breweries in entirely different locations. And our brewery is going to receive equipment from that factory, but it's definitely going to receive equipment from other factories. So while they have a relationship, they really are fundamentally different projects. They have unique sets of impacts, unique sets of permits, unique sets of public engagement processes. So in our case, we are building a factory that is making wind components. And there are going to be companies that are putting together a wind farm and power plant out at sea. The Harbor District is doing this project. Boehm is leading that project. Our factory will supply equipment to that wind farm, but it's also going to supply equipment to other wind farms and maybe not supply equipment at all to the Humboldt call area, lease area. It's certainly possible. Then the Humboldt lease area could receive equipment from us, but it's definitely going to receive equipment from other factories as well. So just understand the relationship between these two and how they're fundamentally different. So long story short, long answer to the question, is the district operating in wind farm? No, we are building a factory to produce the equipment. Our project has a unique set of impacts, permits and engagement processes from Bones process. So if you want to get involved in the offshore wind project off of Humboldt's coast, I encourage you to go to bohm.gov. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and you can click on uh, Humboldt Wind Energy Area. There's the website. You can pause it if you need to see that more, and you can get information on how to get involved in commenting or learning more about that project. And there's a whole NEPA National Environmental Policy Act um, uh, environmental analysis underway. Another question I get is Crowley operating a wind farm? No. Crowley is a port operator. Uh, I encourage you to check out their website. They do not operate offshore wind turbines. They are not a power company. Uh, they're really a shipping company. So they're going to be doing the towing and building the marine facility and operating it or hiring people to operate the cranes. We get a lot of questions about community benefit program. Again, this is the district project. This is not the district's project, so the offshore wind uh, project has a community benefits component and you can get involved in Bohm's project. There has been talk about community benefits of the Harbor District's project and we're still getting there and understanding all of that. You can also learn about all of these topics on the Schatz Energy Research Center website. There's a lot like dozens of studies on offshore wind uh, and it's a really good source uh, of information. So does the Harbor District project include community benefits? Yes. Um, we're going to be a leader in energy decarbonization. We're going to be producing a vast majority or vast diversity of jobs, redeveloping a blighted site, um, stimulating other projects around the Bay. We can have all these opportunities. I've talked about this before. Um, you know, the district will generate revenue towards conservation and recreation projects. So there are inherent community benefits associated with the district's project, and there'll be a lot more about this topic on the district's website. Also encourage you to uh, learn more about the Humble Bay Harbor Recreation Conservation District's purpose. It's all related to community benefits. Um, this is the charter that created the district. And, um, you know, the, the purpose of the district here, probably a little bit overkill, but um, the district is created to improve Humboldt Bay 
for navigation and commerce through the maintenance and construction of channels, shipways, berths, anchorage places, turning basins, etc. And um, the district needs to protect wildlife habitats, establish open space areas for recreation, regulate the use uh, of pollution and dredging, uh, and work closely with planning agencies. Um, so the Harbor District's entire purpose is for the benefit of Humboldt Bay and the people and environments of the Bay. OK, what impacts will the Harbor District's project have? Still evaluating that. Uh, we have a CEQA notice of preparation in the beginning of the whole CEQA process coming up yet. We don't really quite know yet, or we have some pretty good ideas, but we're really getting to those details and we'll be working with the public. Um, to answer those questions through the CEQA process in the coming 12 to 18 months. How can I submit other questions uh, about the Harbor District project? How can you get involved? Um, keep your eye on the district's website. Get involved in the CEQA process when that begins. Another question is how and where will the power cable get from the wind farm to the land? The Shots Energy Research Center has a lot of uh, studies on that topic. It's really not something the Harbor District specializes in. Again, this is our project. Um, what I can tell you is that um, very close to our project, there has been the landing of four Trans-Pacific broadband cables. Um, and so it's very similar uh, process there. Uh, likely those cables, uh, one of them is the longest in the world, and that's where they go. And you can see that they go right through the lease area, and there are efficiencies to bringing the power cables in those same corridors. Um, though they can't be immediately on top of each other because they would interfere with each other um, to minimize impacts on fishermen. It would probably be good practice to bring them uh, close to those same alignments. But again, Harbor District does not specialize in that, and the Shots Energy Research Center has a lot more information. What types of ships will be required to service offshore wind? It's a really good study here from uh, the Central Coast um, that goes into details. I'll Keep going, but if you want more information on that, check out that study or pause this slide. And here's another one. So we're still gathering information on the types of ships that will be coming into the port. Uh, and again, this website has good information on that. How many jobs are these projects create? And what will the economic impact be? And what about housing? Um, the County of Humboldt, especially County Economic Development Department, is seeking answers to those questions. And I encourage you to keep your eye on their website. Uh, and this is just a snapshot of some of the work that they are currently doing on this topic. And SHOTS has good information on that as well. Uh, isn't there a limitation with transmission? How will excess power leave Humboldt County? Again, this is the district's project. We're working on manufacturing the equipment. I don't really know the answer to that. This is not the district's project and transmission is certainly not our project. Um, so SHOTS has answers to that. It's really a fundamentally different process. Also, a good source of information on that is the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. Getting close to the end here, um, will offshore wind increase energy prices? Don't know. It's not our project. Um, can tell you a little bit of information. Um, well, maybe a little overkill in this example here, but the factory that manufactures brewery equipment does not set the prices of beer. Um, we're producing wind equipment, not operating wind farms. So BOEM is really a good source of information about that or a good place to inquire. What I can tell you is that this offshore wind market report is a good uh, source. I encourage you to look that up. Uh, and there's a lot of information there about offshore wind energy costs and price trends. It's also the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, also has good information on that topic and shots. All right, uh, last couple of questions here. Will the district's project impact birds and whales? Again, this is the district's project, not this one. Um, so we're not operating wind turbines. Um, I encourage you to get involved in Bones project for that. One other good source of information is the California Energy or the California Coastal Commission's um, consistency determination for the leasing of the uh, offshore wind areas. So this occurred on April 7th, 2022. You can go to the Coastal Commission's website, go to archives and agendas, and then find this study here. 
and it has a lot of information about the lease area and the density of whales um, in that area and birds. So you can see the density of marble marillets relative to the lease area. And SHOTS has really good information on this. Um, again, district's not operating a wind farm, so our project is not going to be impacting birds or whales out at sea. Will the district's project impact fishermen? Again, this is the district's project, not this. This project has the potential to impact fishermen. I encourage you to get involved with BOEM or check out this study here. Um, this study looked at the density of fishing activities relative to the lease areas. And so it's that same Coastal Commission consistency determination and the intensity of fishing activities relative to the lease area. So there is good information out there, but this isn't the district's project. How about the impacts of tow out um, on fishermen? So when the turbines are manufactured, they have to be towed through this channel and out to sea, and there will be rolling closures of the channel where other users can't use the channel for a short period of time. So it's not the case that the whole channel is going to be closed down all at once. It's more like when you see a really large truck with a large wide load on the highway, and it's got a vehicle in the front and a vehicle in the back. Um, it would be the same case on these tow outs. So there probably will be, you know, a half an hour um, rolling closure uh, as the vessels leave the bay. And we're still figuring that out, trying to find ways to minimize impacts to fishermen. Um, but that is a possibility that it would impact fishermen to some degree. And there are some uh, storage of fishermen equipment on the site in a small area over here, as well as a, uh, a hagfish holding facility. Uh, and a boat repair, and so we're actively working with those tenants to find them really good locations for relocation. But we're talking about construction in 2026, 20, 27 at the soonest, so we've got time um, to work with them. I think this is the last question here. Won't the creation of all this new infrastructure have a large carbon footprint? Is wind power really better for reducing impacts to the global climate? Uh, I don't know. Um, Bohm's study is really a good source for that. Um, but this is also an interesting source of information on the topic. And there's a lot of information here. I'm just going to summarize this quickly. So the relative net carbon output per kilowatt hour of energy generated of wind is 25% of the carbon output of solar. It is only 2% of the carbon output of natural gas and is only 1% of the carbon output of producing energy through the use of coal. Now, these numbers here, I'll explain this again in a moment exactly what all that means, but it factors in mining and raw material acquisition, manufacturing, transport, and operations. So what this means is that for every kilowatt hour of energy produced by offshore wind, the total carbon that that activity puts out relative to coal is only 1%. So that includes the mining of all of the steel that's going to be required to build wind turbines and the manufacturing of all of that steel and the transport of it all and the operations of it. And the reason that wind is so much lower in its carbon output is because a coal-fired power plant, for instance, also has to do a whole lot of mining to build the facility and to acquire the coal and a lot of output to manufacture and a lot of output to transport. And its operational output is nonstop carbon output. Whereas wind, there are some impacts with mining, but no more than the coal. There are impacts for manufacturing, but no more than coal. There are impacts for transport, but no more than coal. But it has no carbon output in its operations. And so even with all of the new industry that needs to be created to make these offshore wind turbines, it is still substantially better at reducing carbon output than any of these other sources of energy generation. So again, check this out, uh, this study. I don't know if I did a good job of summarizing that. And Shots Energy Research Center is an expert in this topic, and I encourage you to learn more from them or from the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. So last question, if you'd like to learn more about offshore wind in general, what's the best source? I'd say that this one is. Um, NRAIL is also an excellent source of information on all of this. Go to nrail.gov, National Renewable Energy Lab. 
And that is the last slide. Um, so thank you very much for your time and um, keep your eye on the Harbor District's website and look forward to engaging with you more in the future.